my dear Cameron Mannheim for that kind introduction and for your commitment to the union and to protecting and advancing the rights of members with disabilities. We go way back and I'm very grateful to have you introduce us. I'm Anita Hollander, National Chair of SAG After Performance performers with disabilities. And I'm coming to you from Hell's Kitchen, New York City. And I'm sitting at my piano. I am a Caucasian woman with blue eyes and brown hair. I'm wearing a a uh, v-neck dress that's black background and pink flowers for spring and I'm wearing a rose quartz necklace around my neck. I would like to, uh, oh, I am also sitting on the unceded lands of Lenape tribe. I honor them and I, my pronouns are she, her, hers. So disability is consistently overlooked in the conversation about diversity and inclusion. The mission of our committee is to achieve full access for and inclusion of performers and broadcasters with disabilities by working to increase employment opportunities and improve working conditions in all areas of entertainment and news media. Last year, I was part of a forum for SAG-AFTRA for the PTEOE online, of course, that Cameron moderated called Performers with Disabilities, Inclusion, Authenticity and allyship. It was held to coincide with the landmark 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. We focused particularly on the portrayal of persons with disabilities by non-disabled -disab performers and its effect on how the media and industry views the community overall. I think it was New York local board member and New York local performers with disabilities committee chair, Christine Bruno, who captured the issue of PWD perfectly when she said, disabled performers are often not allowed to play ourselves because disability is often seen in the industry as a technical skill or a bag of tricks. And many fellow actors get awarded for their performances. But we're here to tell you that disability is not a technical skill, it is a lived experience. So where do we go from here? That's the topic we're here to discuss with my three fellow warriors in the fight for greater disability inclusion in entertainment and media. Joining me today are Jay Ruderman, president and trustee of the Ruderman Family Foundation, one of the foremost organizations pressing for disability inclusion in the industry and elsewhere. Among many other honors, in 2019, Jay was honored at the Media Access Award with sag Afters Disability Awareness Award. We are also joined by Danny Woodburn, my comrade, my, my vice chair of the sag After Performers with Disabilities Committee. He is an actor, comedian, and activist. Also with us today is CJ Jones, an actor of many breakthrough roles in film, broadcast series and commercials, as well as producer, director and writer and creator of the International Sign Language Theater Festival. CJ's work includes a TED Talk, TEDx Talk, and this year Gallaudet's 2021 commencement address. So, Jay, Danny, and CJ, would you please provide us with a visual description of yourself for our blind and low vision guests? Why don't you start, Jay? So I'm a white male, uh, brown hair, blue eyes, wearing glasses, uh, wearing a white shirt, sitting on a gray uh, chair uh, with the background of um, a logo for my podcast, All Inclusive <clears throat> with Jay Ruderman. And uh, Anita, it's my pleasure to join you today and my fellow guests who I know well, Danny Woodburn and CJ Jones. Thank you, Danny. Hi, Danny Woodburn. Um, I'm uh, another one of those white males uh, with dwarfism. Um, I, have the, I have a brown hair beard and the hairline of a cruise ship captain. Um, my shirt, uh, my wife has named Blueberry Buckle. So that should give you a sense of the color. And uh, the background is a Mary Russell painting. 
uh, blue and white uh, lilies, if I recall. Great, thanks, Danny. And CJ. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm a black man. My hair is black and short. I have an eye patch right now with two pieces of tape keeping it on my face. Yesterday I had an accident, so excuse me about that. I'm wearing a blue shirt. My background is a world map with two passports on it on the right and the left. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, CJ, especially for coming today after having an accident. We're, we're really, really glad you're here, even more glad than I already was. I'd like to start, <laughs> thank you. I'd like to start with Jay because uh, there are people watching who actually aren't familiar with the work that the Ruderman Family Foundation does to address disability inclusion in the entertainment industry. And this is gonna be important for us to know in our conversation. So can you give us a little bit of background on how you came to the work in this space? Sure, well, I represent a family foundation based in Boston. Uh, we've been advocating for disability rights for the past two decades. Um, in entertainment, you know, when we started to get involved in advocacy uh, and we would call out politicians or um, celebrities, uh, singers, um, you know, business leaders who were deferring to disability in a derogatory way and we would put out a press release and speak against that. Um, we sort of uh, gradually came into entertainment in the inauthentic portrayal of disability. Uh, first of all, knowing that in the last 30 years, um, half of the men that have won the best actor Oscar have won for playing a disability when they themselves did not have a disability. And we became very critical of movies that were casting able-bodied actors in the roles of disabilities. And we were very harsh in, in our criticism uh, since then, we've evolved into major partnerships with uh, the Academy Awards, the Sundance uh, Film Festival, Yale Drama School, um, and you know many others, Variety, um, in order to elevate the issue of uh, disability as part of diversity. Wonderful. There's just so many facets of what you've done. We're really deeply appreciative of that. CJ, I wanted to know, having just watched the spotlight on Deaf Theater um, a Festival, it was a, a theater festival on Zoom uh, this past weekend, I wanted to hear your remarks on um, authenticity from the Deaf community in casting, in authenticity in casting. Can you just repeat that last part? Yes, uh, I wanted to hear your remarks on the uh, the need and the necessity of authenticity in casting. Yeah, I don't think I was able to watch the spotlight, but I can comment on how important it is to have authentic deaf and hard of hearing um, set up in uh, these workspaces in Hollywood, different sets. And this year has proven that, you know, I've seen for several different reasons. For example, the, I was the director of ASL for um, one set that had a, um, you know, they were, I, I make sure that uh, actors are using the appropriate signs. I make sure that they are signing correctly. And so I have to be on set to educate people and I have an important role on set working with different deaf actors to make sure that they're signing correctly. And also during production, I have to make sure that the sign matches with framing, et cetera, you know, for how the camera angles are, make sure that the hands are in sight. And that's the kind of equality that I have to support and stand for. I have to make sure that the sign is clear. I have to make sure that it's correct. I have to make sure that it appears on camera. <clears throat> We do have a lot of motivation to get deaf people in deaf roles and for them to have access when being in these work environments. I remember on Facebook, there was a commercial 
And there was a whole deaf cast on this one ad that I saw, but the signing was so, I mean, the framing was really awkward. There was some kind of argument and I, you know, so I, I reached out to this, this ad and I told him, you know, this doesn't look right. And, you know, everyone relies on, you know, deaf people to provide the appropriate kind of ASL, but, and I, and I love to be in these roles, but it's the industry really has to change their attitude and be willing to learn and make changes on set is what I mean. That's what I'm talking about. So the authenticity is happening more and more now. Like Godzilla uh, versus Kong. They do have a deaf child actor in that movie. And you know, it's this big crazy movie and the industry is picking up on authentic roles compared to three years ago, I mean. This, these roles, you know, are still coming about. And it's really still below the line with um, working with dis disabled people in the industry. We're trying to, you know, get up to par to where we need to be. And we've had panel discussions about education in the industry to match um, the needs of, you know, people with disabilities on set. And this year we're pushing more and more because we need the authenticity to keep on happening. Thank you, CJ. That was great. Um, in fact, when I my watchdog report of what's going on seems to show that in the past three years that we've that it appears that we have tripled our employment, but we are still on the very low end. But, but it's been heartening to see that some things have come about. And part of this, oh, and by the way, here in New York, the Roundabout Theater just did a disability theater festival online, uh, Reverb. Yes, Garrett Zercher did a play in there. And, uh, and what's great to see it on YouTube right now, there's three versions of watching the festival. There's uh, a captioned edition, there's an AS, live ASL edition, and there is audio description. Um, so that if you have a specific need that you want, you can watch the whole festival on, on all those uh, platforms. Um, but about that progress that we're trying to make, uh, Jay, your foundation came up with an incentive for studios and networks and content creators to follow some guidelines, which you gave, on auditioning actors with disabilities. And several organizations, including Viacom, CBS, and NBC Universal have committed to the to following the foundation's guidelines on auditioning actors with disabilities in each new production. Now I know it may be too early for uh, for data, but anecdotally, are you seeing improvements in the casting process? Well, I think I am, but maybe Danny and CJ, who are who are active actors in the field, would probably answer this better. However, you know, actors I know with disabilities uh, like Kurt Yeager, Eileen Grubba, um, uh, Marley Matlin, Danny, CJ, I, I, I'm hearing about more roles that people are, are landing. Um, I, I'll have to say this whole thing was a process of first being super critical and, and, and also commissioning um, uh, white papers. Danny was one of the authors, but first showing like, hey, you know, a couple of years back, only 5% of uh, characters with disabilities were authentically portrayed. Then it jumped up to 22% um, a few years ago. We also did a marketing study showing that 25% um, of, of the United States population, the world population has a disability. And there's billions of dollars um, that the industry can make by authentic portrayal. And most people in this survey said they want to see authentic portrayal. But I think Anita, you mentioned there is a mindset that playing disability 
by an able-bodied actor is great acting. And we've seen that by who's won Academy Awards. I, I, I think that diversity in the industry has an impact on stigma. And we've seen great leaps and bounds in terms of um, other groups, um, African-Americans, Hispanic, LBGTQ, Asian communities, so many different communities that have progressed and the disability community has progressed, but not enough. And I think what I would say is, is the entertainment industry has to understand that disability is part of diversity. You know, Michelle Obama once said that most of us get to know people who are not like us through entertainment. Um, and and we, did, we did a video with Octavia Spencer in which she said that the first show that she saw on TV that she really identified with as a child was the Jeffersons. So I think that authentic portrayal does have an impact on society. Now, our discussions with studios, first of all, we started with CBS, Viacom, and we were lucky, um, and Danny was involved to connect um, with uh, uh, Tiffany Smith Anoye, and she really got it and immediately said, yes, we'll open all our additions to actors with disabilities. We've since got NBC Universal to join, and there are two other studios that we're working on that we expect to be announced very soon. So I think the understanding in the industry is, whoops, we left out a major sector of society from the diversity conversation and diversity is important. I think we're getting there. I think we're gonna see more and more uh, progress, but this seems to be, I don't know what Danny or CJ thinks, it seems to be the last community at the table in terms of authentic representation. Yes. I, I, would, I, I would definitely agree with Jay, um, but I do want to give a little reality check to the numbers. Although we see these changes happening, um, we also have to understand that uh, 10 years ago, before the streaming craze, there were about 125 television shows on air, on air uh, any given season. Now, at this stage, there's over 500. So we have to think about <laughs> that shift as well before we think about you know how many more people. And if we go back to the 2010 correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, a 2010 collab report where we had six characters with disability on network television prime time and only one authentically portrayed by uh, the person whose position you have uh, filled, uh, Robert David Hall. That's, that is, we are leaps and bounds beyond that. But still, we have to look at, at where we should be um, always in this goal because you know we make up 25 percent of the population uh but still you know laws get written and accepted by say new york state uh where they're looking to increase uh, diversity diversity higher say for writers if you hire a writer who's a person of color or a woman then you you get a tax break for your production company but the same they don't include and they refuse to include disability in that equation uh, or the LGBT community. They refuse to include those uh, communities in that equation. So I find, I find that a law that keeps getting, that gets filled, it's supposed to be a diversity law um, that is exclusive of any community is not authentically diverse. That is absolutely true. And I just wanted to add also that I'm an amputee and when I'm performing, I don't have to pretend, I have, don't have to spend all of my acting uh, on acting like an amputee or uh, because that's all done. All I have to do is concentrate on acting the character. And that is true with any actor with a disability. Someone doesn't have to pretend they're deaf. They, uh, they actually, they have that out of the way. They're already deaf. They can actually perform the character, the role. And I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to add to what you just said. Yes. Um, I, I am just under four feet and no amount of Stanislavski technique is gonna allow me to reach the top shelf at a grocery store. I'm just saying, I, I can't act like I'm six two. 
Yes, I think CJ, do you have something? Uh, you looked like you were just about to say something. So I'm going to just go straight to you. Please, please let us yeah. know. Yeah, I had an itch that I wanted to share with you all. Um, it's important that, you know, like we've been saying, things are happening within the industry, but we want to supplement that, right? With my experience, what I've seen this year coming up more and more, I've been seeing more people with disabilities, more deaf and hard of hearing showing up to auditions, um, more people on set. And this year, um, there was three actors selected for deaf roles. So I'm seeing more and more. And yes. I think it's really cool to see how the buzz is going on. We see articles about this now, right? We're seeing articles, we're seeing exposure more and more. We're seeing more sharing around the world that it's important, you know, for the disabled community to be visible. And we're seeing these articles being published. We're seeing the industry publish more information about this and we're making it happen. We're making access for all people. And the articles, you know, these things that are being published, these publications are powerful and they're getting out there. Indeed, that is very true. And, um, and actually a book just came out that, that a show I wrote is actually in that anthology and it's, it's called the, At the Intersection of Disability and Drama, which is uh, I was amazed at how many people were excited about it because I thought, man, it's this big anthology and, you know, nobody wants, but in fact, people, you're right, CJ, people actually were like, yeah, we need that. We need resources. And that's what's being provided. So, so thank you, CJ. Um, I want to make sure we talk about one thing, Danny, and that is allyship. What can actors who have no disabilities, what, what can their role be in this? Because, and I've seen some really great ally actions in in the past but what let let everybody know what can they do to help well, i can i can anecdotally um uh put some light on that uh back when um uh, brian cranston did the upside uh you know there was a there was a lot of flack that came back uh and it was continuous. It might have died down a little in the press, but it was continuous in our community. So I reached out to Brian and I said, hey, you know, this is what's going on. And he says, well, press has said it's, it's sort of dying down. And I said, in the press, <laughs> it's dying down. But in the community, it's not dying down. So I wanted to know if you'd had, you know, meet with me, have a cup of coffee and, and have a discussion about it. And um, we, we sat for about 45 minutes over coffee, nice, casual, two old buddies uh, meeting up and um, I told him what the frustrations were and he explained to me you know a number of things that I don't think came out like how long ago this had been offered to him and and also the the very real part of this which is uh, marquee Brian is a marquee name right so that his name is going to sell the film and I said that's a legitimate understanding but also if if people with disabilities aren't given opportunities, they're not gonna make it to that place of marquee, um, which he understood fully. So I said, do this, you know, when you have this opportunity and, and you're in a film and there's disability representation that's gonna be done by somebody who's an A-lister, um, if you take one job away, you have to give back three. So you have to put three people with disability in that film. And I feel like that is so it should be like a should be like a contractual thing in a way. You know, if you're going to take a job from a disabled performer, make sure that you've given back at least three other jobs in that same production. So that's I feel like that's an important uh, part of this picture. And talking to studios and saying the same kinds of things. If you if you have to cast somebody, and it's going to keep happening, The Sound of Metal, right, is another example, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we have to make sure that we, we not only do we give those, those actors an opportunity, other deaf, deaf and hard of hearing performers opportunity in that same film, but we also profile them. We highlight them. We get them out there to the press. Um, you know, I think, I think CJ's experience on Baby Driver was, a was, a in terms of the press 
you know, they, they looked at CJ and went, he's a, he's a real talent. How can we capitalize on this, right? And so, it, it, and they did, and it became like a major, major selling point of the film. The fact that's, that we had an authentically deaf performer, multiply marginally deaf and black, holy crap. We've got, you know, <laughs> we've got all of this going on in this film. Let's, let's put some light on it. Let's pat ourselves on the back. You know, so that's what networks and studios need to do is start patting themselves on the back, but actually doing the work that allows them to do that. Yes. And, and I want to add, I always tell people when they say marquee box office name, Marley Matlin was not a box office name when she was cast in Children of a Lesser God and she walked away with the Oscar. She uh, she was not known and she became known. So I, I always push back a little bit on that argument. An another great allyship situation was that Matt Jaeger, actor who is not deaf, was called in to audition for a deaf role um, because he could sign but when he got when he spoke to them they said well I will audition but you have to audition deaf actors uh, I need you to see so and so and Troy Kotzer a deaf actor ended up with the role because Matt went out to bat for them I we realize jobs are jobs everybody needs them especially now but Matt did not go to the audition he just said I will audition if you will audition authentic uh, deaf actors for this role. So that's another way of allyship. Good point. So Jay, um, each year the foundation honors productions with a seal of authentic representation. Can you talk a little bit about the goal of that program and what are the recipients doing right that other productions should model? Maybe we've already covered it, but if you have anything more to add to that. Sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, with the upcoming Academy Awards, you know, we're seeing progress that we haven't seen in previous years. So Marley Matlin will be a presenter. Um, she is the only living uh, actor uh, with a disability um, uh, to win an Oscar, and, and she'll be presenting this year. Crip Camp uh, is up for an Oscar, which is a documentary about the disability rights movement. So I think we're, we're seeing you know, some progress. What we've done with the seal of approval, and first of all, I have to say, you know, unlike Danny and CJ, we're an outsider. We're a Boston-based organization. Yes, we have some resources, and, but we can, we can operate in a way that we are, we have no stake in the game. You know, we're, we're not invested in, in the industry. So when we approach a studio and, and so forth, uh, we're really an outside organization. But the seal of approval was, was an idea to take uh, mostly television shows, but some movies that did authentically portray uh, an actor um, with a disability and to give them a credit. Um, and we usually ask for a quote from the show um, and, and, and we've gotten it and, and it, it gets more press. So I think the industry says, yes, these are some shows that have done it and, and done it in the right way. And I will say that, you know, there are people in the industry um, like Edgar Wright, um, Scott Silveri, uh, Glenn Mazzara, um, and others who've done a really great job at, at, at really, John Krasinski at, at pushing the authentic portrayal of disability. Um, we need more people like that. So it's to give the people that are doing the right thing the praise, and it's still criticizing, you know, when you see an inauthentic portrayal of disability. I, I don't think we've never taken the position that every uh, portrayal of disability needs to be authentically portrayed, but the more people with actors with disabilities who do authentically portray the characters, I think it changes public perception about disability. Disability doesn't become something like, oh, it's an interesting story, but we don't really want to see people with disabilities. It becomes, yes, there is a significant part of our society and there's an empowerment of seeing authentic portrayal of any, any group. And I will add to that, Jay, that um, we want to be seen for roles that are not necessarily disabled. And I, I have a perfect example of FBI Most Wanted, where I played a role last year, who um, was a landlady. 
she was the landlady. She was kind of funny. And um, when it came to doing the role, I asked the director one leg or two. And he said, I don't care however you feel comfortable. He said, but I actually like the idea of the one legged landlady. So I did the role on one leg and nothing had to be said about it. She just happened to have one leg. And people think that it has to be in the script or explained away or something. But it was great just the way it was and it was that kind of a director that we want to see more of because they um they have this wonderful picture of let's see something unique and different and we don't have to talk about it it's just there she lives next door you know she's the secretary she's the judge so um to wrap up, I just wondered if any of the three of you wanted to say one particular thing that the industry, the entertainment industry could do tomorrow. We've talked about a lot of them, but a prescription. What could they do starting today or tomorrow to improve disability inclusion? Is there anything we missed? I, 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 would, I would say... Um... Uh, engaging with this community, you know, through all the resources. I, I mentioned some resources, but I also want to mention the, the talent in the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. Uh, you know, that's been going on for a number of years, and there's, you know, at this point, hundreds of actors and actresses that have been showcased in that film challenge. Um, but also to engage with this community and look for creatives uh, and have our community also seek out. Uh, networks and studios and production companies and present their ideas. Um, you know, I've been shopping around a, a show called Gumshoes for a while now about four kids with disabilities who form a school club detective agency. So that's that's one of the things I feel like I've got these four great kids authentically cast. And, and from that, we've developed uh, two other shows that we're trying to get out there, uh, family family style shows, like in the vein of, in the vein of like uh, uh, Blackish or whatever, you know, so we're, we're trying to show that, hey, these stories are out there and you should consider them because of like studies like Jay's, uh, you know, authentic stream, authentic representations of disability and streaming and how much, how much uh, market there is for these kinds of, of, of television shows. That's right. And uh, I know that CJ and I both have been on other side, the other side of the camera and directors. And so Danny, we're all writers. We've all written our own material, uh, which I would encourage everybody to do. I mean, I have a show now that can tour around the world uh, that I just put it out there. And it's not, it's not always as hard as people think if they just start to create, create material and, and have people see it. I, I think we have to wrap up now, but I want to thank CJ and Danny and Jay for, uh, for all your incredible insights and your contributions. And um, we will continue to fight the good fight. And thanks to you guys. I, I think we are headed in pushing that boulder up the hill. We're actually getting it a few, few feet higher. So thank you all very, very much. And thank you SAG after for this opportunity. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Thank you very much.